everybody and welcome to another brand new episode of T Watches a Scary Movie. My name is T and of course we're talking scary movies. I appreciate you tuning in for another brand new episode. Remember, new episodes go up every Wednesday night, the video version at 8.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on the YouTube page, which is youtube.com slash C slash Theron Reynolds Scary Movie. And of course, you can catch the audio only version half an hour earlier at 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on all your favorite podcasting platforms just by searching Twasm or T Watches a Scary Movie. Now, of course, if you're not subscribed to those, you want to make sure you get subscribed to the link tree, which is linktr.ee slash T Scary Movie. That will give you all the updates you need for all my various platforms, the YouTube, the audio channels, but also it'll link you to things like my TikTok, where I've been doing a lot of toy uh, toy revealings lately, including the uh, animatronic Crypt Keeper from Spirit Halloween and a new lineup uh, for the Gargoyles uh, Manhattan Clan from NECA. Uh, but also you can get linked to my Twitter where I'm discussing horror movies like all day every day on there as well too. So get subscribed to the link tree so you can stay up to date on everything that I'm discussing in the world of horror. So, what do I have for you guys tonight? We just got done going over the top 10 horror films of 2023 thus far, and now we're talking some more new movies. Last week, I got done talking about one of my favorite films of the year, Play Dead, featuring a riveting performance from Jerry O'Connell, just completely different from anything we've seen him do before. Y'all can check out that review by hitting that link above, but already, we have another movie that is right up there for me with the top, the top film, the top horror film of 2023, and that is The Angry Black Girl and Her Monster. So I'm gonna be talking about that here tonight, and we got just a little bit of horror news to discuss with y'all as well too. So let's not waste any time. Let's jump right into it here. We're gonna start with our horror news. So this past weekend, we got the fifth entry in the Insidious series, Insidious The Red Door. This new entry being directed by series star Patrick Wilson debuted just this past weekend. And folks, it is on fire. Coming off a budget of only $16 million, the film has already grossed almost $72 million, showing that this series is not slowing down anytime soon. Now, I have not seen this film yet. I'm actually going to go and see it this week. I'll have my review for y'all next week, of course, for that. But uh, I don't know, because I've enjoyed the Insidious series. Uh, I, I say that revealing to all of you that uh, I actually just got done watching uh, watching the first and the second one for the very first time last week. So I, I wanted to knock those out so I could actually get to know these movies a little bit more because I'd always seen the third one that doesn't have anything to do with Patrick Wilson's character, Rose Byrne's character, the Lambert family. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with them at all, but it brought back um, it, it brought back Lynn Shay's Elise. We had uh, Tucker and Specs in there as well too, and I really did enjoy that film. So I went back and watched the first two movies. Thought they were decent, not great. I don't think they're as amazing as a lot of people out there uh, set them to be, honestly. I definitely don't think they're as interesting as The Conjuring films, and that's not a negative mark against it. It's not like they have to be compared to each other, but I do enjoy The Conjuring series more than I do the Insidious series. And The Last Door, uh, excuse me, The Red Door has not been getting a lot of good marks on it. So I'm very much excited to see at the conclusion to, uh, at least the supposed conclusion to La uh, the Lambert story in this film series and make up my mind for myself. So I'll be back next week with a review on that, but it's awesome that again, horror just continues to do amazing folks. It's making all of this money. That's exactly what we wanna see in this genre. So yay for another big summer horror blockbuster, just knocking it right out of the park. Fantastic. Now, other thing I wanted to talk about here isn't really so much in the way of news, but it was brought to my attention as I was scrolling through horror Twitter uh, just earlier today there. 
that there were a lot of alternate endings to the film uh, Unfriended Dark Web. That's a movie I've talked about on here before. Love it. Uh, the sequel to the film about a group of friends who are doing like a group chat, a Zoom call, Skype call online, and a ghost inhabits their chat and starts killing all of them off. Um, shot entirely through that perspective. It kind of led to the film's uh, like searching, missing. Y'all know I said that uh, 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 the missing is the, the best horror film of the year. It's so good. It's it's so so good um but we got a sequel unfriended dark web which uh put things a little bit more into reality at the time to where our lead characters were again in a skype call in a zoom call playing games hanging out and stuff but the whole idea here was that a group of hackers from the dark web infiltrated their call and started killing all the friends in this group and so on and I found out there were alternate endings to that film because in the ending that I saw, it went very badly for everybody. All of our lead characters, turns out that, hey, this was a trap, this was a trick. They were all being pulled in into this dark web of conspiracy and they all got killed for it by the end of the film. And I saw some chilling alternate endings for that earlier today, and that made me start thinking about what were some of my favorite like alternate endings out there in the world of horror, because there's a lot. Horror is one thing that actually does that quite a bit more so than any other genre out there, to where it's not uncommon to see various endings tried out, whether it's something as simple as like Deep Blue Sea. If you didn't know, in the original cut of Deep Blue Sea, the lead character, our lead character, and y'all will have to forgive me because uh, I don't remember her name, but it's played by Saffron Burroughs, um, the doctor who was basically running all these experiments on the sharks. She got killed in the, uh, in the, er, uh, wait a minute. Didn't, didn't she die in the, in the original version of that film? Oh God. She didn't die. That's what it was. Oh my God. I'm just realizing this. Yeah. Sorry guys. I'm going, going around there because I'm thinking of the alternate version. But in the original version, her character survives. Because you might remember towards the end of the movie, uh, it's her, Tom Jane, LL Cool J are the only three that's left at this point. Sharks are about to escape the pen and they're trying to figure out what the hell they could do to stop the sharks from getting out there. Because these are smart sharks. You want, don't want these smart sharks out in the ocean. And so they, uh, uh, the lead character played by Saffron Burroughs jumps into the water, shark kills her, and then it gives enough time for Tom J and LL Cool J to blow the shark up. But in the original cut of that, she actually survives. Shark doesn't get her, she's able to climb out, and that's the end of it, which some of you might not have known. And again, I started thinking about all these other horror films out there that had really interesting alternate endings. And I'd love to hear from y'all about maybe some of the uh, alternate endings that you've seen on DVDs, on Blu-rays, on 4Ks, on YouTube. Tell me about some of your favorite alternate endings that are out there. I know one that I really think about a lot is The Descent. Y'all remember The Descent from 2005? Bunch of women go uh, go spelunking inside all these underground caves. They get trapped in there. There's a bunch of cave people living in there that try to eat and kill all of them. Now, the original version, the UK version, if you've seen this movie, and we're over the 10 year rule, so we're gonna break this right here for you if you've never heard of it before, but I don't know how that's possible. But in the American version of the film, I, I was gonna start the UK, we'll do American, but in the American version, in the ending of The Descent, our lead character, Sarah, uh, she escapes from this cave finally. All of her friends are dead or presumed dead at that point. She's just absolutely driven mad by this, gets back to one of their cars and is leaving. And as she's getting the car started, a truck comes by scaring the shit out of her. She throws up due to just everything hitting her all at once. And when she comes back up, she sees her dead friend Juno seated right next to her, screams, end of the movie, okay? Now that's presumably supposed to be a happy ending as they told director Neil Marshall that he had to put a happier ending in the film for American audiences. So that's what American audiences got. But in the UK version, scene doesn't end there. After Sarah sees her dead friend Juno in the seat right next to her, we're suddenly shifted right back to the cave and we realize that Sarah was knocked unconscious earlier in the film and did not actually escape from the cave. She's still trapped within, but now we see that Sarah is hallucinating her, uh, her dead daughter, having a birthday cake right in front of her, which has been a motive throughout the entire film. And we start hearing the screeching of the, the crawlers all around her and it ends it on a less optimistic note. That is the UK and the original ending of The Descent that I absolutely 
absolutely love uh, because it makes sure that the descent part two doesn't happen Ugh, can't stand that film at all but i want y'all to tell me in the comments section what's an alternate ending off a horror film that you love that you love talking about love watching tell me that in the comment section hit me with that and folks when we return i'll be back with my review of the angry black girl and her monster stay tuned Hey everybody, looking for a great way to stay up to date on horror news as well as read the best of articles on anything scary out in the world right now? Then you need to head over to the Fangoria shop and get yourself a subscription. If you go to shop.fangoria.com slash AXDW, you can use my own personalized 20% discount to save 20% off on Fangoria Magazine subscriptions as well as 20% off any other items in their fantastic shop. This is a great deal. If you've ever been wanting to get yourself a subscription, now is the time to do so. Head to shop.fangoria.com slash AXDEW. Welcome back to T Watches a Scary Movie. Folks, we are here in movie reviews and we are here to talk the angry black girl and her monster. Now, I want to remind y'all again that you want to use JustWatch.com. It is a terrific website that can let you know the best place to stream any movie or television show you're looking for, whether that's available for free or whether it's something you have to rent or purchase. Use JustWatch.com to find where all your movies and TV shows are currently being streamed. Now, from all reports regarding the angry black girl and her monster, I knew to expect a Frankenstein-esque uh, tale about a genius and the monster she creates, but not much else. I didn't really know what else to expect from this story because I wasn't following it that much, to be honest. And I don't know if I truly needed to know those other details because most ad adaptations of Mary Shelley's work um, tend to focus on a lot of the same beats, okay? Someone looking to cure death. Uh, and they end up creating a monstrosity in order to do that. And then that monster goes on a murderous rampage. And then that same someone realizing the magnitude of their obsession and how that's impacted not only them, but the entire world around them as well, too. And unless we're unwrapping the complexities between like the first monster and the bride, I say first monster, um, but and I, I'm using this more so off the movie than I am necessarily the book. But unless we're like we're looking at like that relationship and everything that goes into creating the bride of Frankenstein, they tend to really be simple stories that uh, teach us morality lessons over playing God and accepting death. And that would explain exactly why I was completely caught off guard uh, by all that writer and director Bamani J Story unpacks and what's undoubtedly, at least right this moment, the best horror film of the year, folks. I know, I just got done telling you about how The Boogeyman was the best horror film of the year, folks, but that reign is now broken. It held that for a little bit over a month, and now the angry girl, angry black girl and her monster is taking the reins, folks. Um, Leia De, uh, De, uh, De Leon Hayes stars as Vicaria, a 17-year-old girl, and by all evidence, genius, who has found her life plagued by a disease. Losing both her mother and brother to uh, senseless gang violence, Vicaria has long looked, as de looked at death as a disease that can be diagnosed and cured. And after seemingly finding the answer, she looks for a way to cure the other problems of the terrible world she inhabits as she descends further and further into madness. Uh, you know, putting Mary Shelley's story against the backdrop of an inner city environment that's rife with gangs, drugs, and violence actually seems like the perfect updating of like the German and French settings of the original story. Class is still made out to be a huge factor with Vicaria experiencing prejudice, not just from uh, not just from her classmates and her teachers, but from the like her own colleagues as well too. You have gangs that are running uh, uh, running uh, everywhere at her home, infecting every single crevice with drugs and violence, and it fuels them just like the mob 
blobs back in the like the original versions of Frankenstein were fueled by like all these outbreaks of disease and famine and war all these things that drove them uh, to mob as well too and the symbolism of the film is never lost in its surroundings I think that Bomami uh, managed to use every single shot to uh, uh, to show that it's not just Vicaria who's struggling with the enormity of this world that's around her, but the rest of her friends and family are struggling just as much too. And that's ultimately what pushes Vicaria to decide that she's going to resurrect her recently uh, passed brother, Chris. Now, neither Vicaria or her father, uh, D Donald, who's played by Chad L. Coleman, who you might know from The Walking Dead or from Superman and Lois, uh, they haven't been able to deal with their enormous losses that they felt in life. Um, Vicaria definitely is looking to cheat confronting those feelings by bringing it back. And I know, I know from uh, from reading Frankenstein way back in the day and watching like the various the various adaptations of it that it is more so that they're looking to cure death. And we have to look under the surface and realize that the whole obsession with curing death is just not being able to face it. It's not being able to accept that it's so finite that this person or this thing is just gone. They no longer exist when it comes to you anymore. And uh, just like the original story, you know, after Vicaria, as this creator, brings her brother back to life, she herself uh, realizes that these repercussions are not just going to be for her. They're going to be for everybody that's around her as well, too. And it's a sad tale that gives us a clear look at the way that kids are influenced in our world today. You know, Chris was a victim of gang violence and his father ends up falling into this same exact lifestyle and because of grief and even one of vicaria's young friends who's around her neighborhood ends up getting pulled into this web of gang violence as well too and it's a stark a cold cold uh reality that a lot of people who see this film are going to see realizing that this is life for a lot of people that are out there they don't have those kind of choices and sometimes the only way that you can deal with these things is to put yourself into something bigger than yourself like a gang can be at times you know and vicaria may be our point of view but we still see the world as through the eyes of the monster in quite a number of different places in this movie um and the rage that this monster has for this world can only be seen in glimpses the fact that it's seen as a monster you know the entire purpose the the entire idea here vicaria had was to bring chris back to bring her brother back so her and her father didn't have to really deal with that and she never stopped to understand that nobody would see chris the way that he was that everybody would see him just as this monster because that doesn't look like the rest of them you hear what i'm kind of putting out there again it's a whole black story with that as well too and there isn't any shock and awe with any of these deaths. They are truly like terrible, heinous acts that those around are forced to endure and watch. And it, it, it's crazy because there were so many times I had to turn my, my head away from like what Chris was doing to these characters on scene because it, it wasn't even about the blood and the gore. Um, his actual anger was just downright terrifying. And it absolutely managed to make each death like even though they're extremely brutal and violent and gory like seeing chris commit them was even worse at that point point. and in a number of cases the fact that vicaria has to witness them and like some of these times like chris is absolutely saving vicaria from something worse from somebody attacking her or somebody that might harm her and yet it's still she's terrified by what she's seeing by what she's enduring herself and that really just stood out to me honestly this movie shook me and it left me more than a uh, more than a few tears running down my face by the time the credits ended up hitting and getting to see these versions of such like renowned characters over oh you know over the decades at this point that look like me is it, it's it's an indescribable feeling honestly it, you know it's something that I think this is a story that I would want to show younger generations as they're coming up as a way of getting them back into these kinds of stories because so many of us grew up on universal monsters and i get it frank it's not like frankenstein dracula you know the wolfman all these guys were created by universal 
But that's how a lot of us know them, is that there were those films they created and then just kept adapting and making sequels, and they've been remade over and over. And I think everybody has their version of these films that are out there. For the longest time, mine was definitely Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the one with Robert De Niro and Kenneth Branagh, you know, back in 90, 94, I think it was. And this film is so good. It, 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 like, I'm, I, I'm able to relate to it so well seeing myself that this is absolutely going to be the version I'm going to end up being, being stuck to, I'm going to stick to moving forward to suggest to people. You know, Vicaria is a perfect representation of so many young black women uh, who are smarter beyond their years. And even though they're dealing with an unfair system and in so many situations they're just getting put down and down and down, they still find a way to inspire and be insightful to uh, the younger generation around her. And I think that Hayes does such an amazing job with all of this and the portrayal that I found myself loving just the other defiance uh, in the movie that she puts up against all these people who stand uh, stand against her. It's, it's an absolute top tier performance and it's a way that a lot of us are gonna be able to like actually take in this story more than we ever could before, honestly. Um, we've had a tremendous year for original and adapted horror works and yet I still find myself surprised when filmmakers decide to go back to the classics. Uh, apparently not only is there a lot of juice still left to be squeezed, but it's actually good juice as well too, which is weird to think about. And the angry black girl and her monster should absolutely be seen on the same level as other films like The Shape of Water, The Invisible Man, you know, adaptations of these stories that we've seen before. They just knock it out of the park. And if we can keep getting these absolute gems, updating these universal monsters more and more, then our youth are in for a much better ride than all of us had when we were growing up. Folks, The Angry Black Girl and Her Monster is available to rent for $6.99 and up and available for purchase at $9.99 and up on most digital platforms. Check it out right now, folks. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I appreciate you tuning in for another brand new episode. Make sure to hit that like button. Make sure to subscribe. And if you're listening on the podcasting platforms, yeah, leave me a review as well too, folks. I appreciate you watching. I'll catch y'all here next week. My name is T. We've been talking scary movies. Stay scared. Hey everybody, I appreciate you tuning in for another brand new episode, movie review, game review, whatever it is now at this point. Don't forget, you want to get subscribed to my official channel so you can stay up to date for when I'm dropping new episodes, reviews, news, whatever it is. The best way to do that is get subscribed to my link tree. That's going to be linktr.ee slash tscarymovie. Again, link tr.ee slash t scary movie that'll keep you up to date with new videos podcast links for the audio only version as well as my letterbox where you can find written reviews get subscribed and don't forget keep watching scary movies folks stay scared